I think we're dealing with two general categories of people who have problems with motivation and focus. I think we failed to describe the fact that there are two groups and not one. We think, well, I need to calm myself enough to move forward. And then other people say, well, no, you need to kind of ramp yourself up to move forward. Here's the way I conceptualize it based on the data that I'm aware of. Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing, 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. An ice bath is doing the exact same thing. Stimulating adrenaline response, it, it actually improves the immune system. There's a mm -hmm. published paper on this, releases adrenaline, which buffers the immune system against infection. But getting good at taking yourself from low, low energy to higher energy, and then learning how to compress your focus. And I'll talk about the focus thing in a minute. Some people are so agitated, the monkey mind, they got too many things going on and they're thinking, okay, they're trying to sit down and write. I suffer from this and I'm feeling like, wait, I've also got this person I need to connect with and I'm kind of dr being drawn off course by not being able to put the blinders on. For people that have that issue, I think learning how to calm the nervous system is very powerful. And the best way that I know how to do that is based on two studies, one published in Nature, one published in Cell Reports recently, showing that physiological size are one of the fastest ways to bring our overall levels of autonomic arousal down. And a physiological sigh is a two inhales followed by an extended exhale. So it's like, it's not just a deep breath, it's two inhales followed by an exhale, mm. okay? And the, what, that, what that does, dilates the, the little sacs of the lungs, and that second inhale dilates them a little bit more, and it pulls a little bit of carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream so that when we exhale, we offload the maximum amount of carbon dioxide, and it perfectly adjusts the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the bloodstream and lungs. And sometimes it only takes one of these double inhale exhales. Sometimes somebody needs to do two or three. But that's the fastest way to bring the autonomic nervous system down. Just say one other thing about focus. So when we're in a high alert state, something very powerful happens. When there's a certain amount of adrenaline in our system, our pupils dilate. Remember, the eyes are not connected to the brain. Our eyes are actually two pieces of central nervous system. They are two pieces of brain outside the skull that were designed to control our overall arousal state. When I bring up the level of adrenaline in my body through breathing, or let's say I see a troubling text, the pupils dilate. And when that happens, our visual system actually enters something that's a little bit more like portrait mode on our phone. Mm. There's a process called accommodation and your ability to focus on one thing visually actually becomes better and your ability to see everything else blurs away. And that's the ability to just see that screen of text or that if you work, work on you know, pad and paper to just see that pad and paper. Uh -huh. And then as you start writing, what people don't realize is that mental focus follows visual focus. Most people, your visual focus, as you bring that into really sharp relief, that image of your book and you stare at it, you're gonna feel some agitation and your mind's gonna be jumping all over the place. But if you wait just a couple minutes, the rest of the world will disappear. I think this is sort of like the flow state people are looking for, but the visual focus, is what brings the rest of the brain into cognitive focus. And people in the martial arts understand this. You've probably experienced this running when you're feeling exhausted and you can just concentrate on one milestone and get there. You can almost bring that into like, you, what you're doing is you're linking that to the dopamine circuitry. You're saying that thing is the milestone, not winning the race, not some other thing outside this, this immediate environment, that thing. And when you're able to start capturing these peripheral circuits, meaning the body, the diaphragm, the visual system, then you start getting past this whole idea of mindsets and it really becomes about the body setting the mind. And this is where I think when you say action leads the rest, mm -hmm. right? It's, that's a, what you're saying is, a, is grounded in real neuro, neurobiological data. When our focus is very narrow, time starts to feel thin sliced. You're perceiving more events per unit time. So it's like a metronome that's going faster. Mm. When our gaze is dilated, so when we're relaxed, there's actually a, 
what happens is the pupil kind of relaxes a bit. It doesn't always get bigger or smaller, but what happens is we re when we're relaxed, so if you view a horizon, for instance, or you go into what's called panoramic vision, so even though I'm looking at you right now, I can dilate my gaze without moving my head or eyes, so I can see the corners of the room and the ceiling. I can see myself in the environment. When we do that, our perception of time broadens and we feel like we have more time. And what we're doing when we do that focus versus defocus, as I call it, or focal vision versus panoramic vision, is you're toggling on and off the autonomic nervous system for alertness. You're turning on and off that, that norepinephrine yeah. circuit. And so it's conscious control over a brainstem circuit. And this is why I don't like the phrase autonomic because that means automatic. It's a misnomer. And if you really look at the realm of high performance, what you start to realize is people who are very good at their respective sport or career or in the special operations community, what they do are exceptionally good at turning on and off these systems. So they're highly functional at achieving their milestones, but they're not spending out extra energy. Mm. Because when you go into panoramic vision, you start to uncouple this space time thing and you get some rest and relaxation. The way to get better at duration path and outcome is to engage in activities that are low duration path and outcome, where your brain is not in modes of analyzing duration path and outcome. What's the one phase of our life when we're not thinking about duration, path, and outcome at all? Sleep. Sleep. And so the reason why you can pull somebody's mind apart, their ability to think rationally and analyze duration, path, and outcome by sleep depriving them is because sleep, despite all its neurochemical complexity, is really when we restore our ability to analyze duration, path, and outcome. Now you think about buds and you go, no wonder they sleep deprive them. They're, they're trying to figure out who has the ability to control these mechanisms and who doesn't. Most people fail. So when I think about how to recover, I've, I actually don't think about recovery as its own thing. I think about recovery as giving buoyancy or improving my ability to focus. So sleep, is a turning off of these brain circuits that are thinking about what's happening next. So the other thing is that just merely going into panoramic vision, say between a meeting, instead of looking at your phone, more focal vision, you're working hard on your book, maybe you walk to the kitchen, just two seconds of what I call deliberate decompression, where you just kind of let your mind go broader, will allow you to reset your focus much more intensely when you return to, to that book, as opposed to if you'd looked at your phone or engaged yeah. even in some other kind of deep, duration path outcome type uh, function of the brain. So when you start thinking about meditation, it's also valuable because a lot of meditation involves focusing on your breath. I actually think a lot of people are, are spending out this ability. They're, they're working too hard in their, the activities that are designed to reset them. Think that we can all do ourselves a great service and perform much better in what we're doing by taking little micro recoveries in the form of dilating our gaze in between meetings, just for a second. Viewing a horizon is the best way to do it because it naturally brings the eyes into defocus. We're doing this in VR because we can control uh -huh. the visual environment completely. When you go into this defocus mode, you turn off that brainstem circuit, you're conserving norepinephrine for your next bout of focus and activity. Otherwise you're spending it. And the brain doesn't care how you spend it. Doesn't care if it's on Instagram, doesn't care if it's watching mm -hmm. the news. But learning how to defocus very, and then refocus very quickly can get you through a race that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to get through. It saves you energy and it, and it builds energy.